can't see a thing. Praise God, praise God. Brother Nick, I just made you a moderator. Amen, sister, amen. <laughs> this is all new to me. We'll see how it goes. Praise God, praise God. <laughs> amen, good evening. Praise God, everybody, we're almost home. Let's go. Let's go. Amen, sister, saw that. There's Steve. All right, got two mods in. What's up, brother Larry? Praise God. Double glasses on, you know that means business. Awesome. Listen, God is so good. God actually answered. God gave me something right before I clicked the button it, it, about 15 minutes ago. It's the original thought that I had that started this whole thing off. So you guys will have to hear that. It's going to be awesome. What's up, brother? What's up? Praise God. Let's go. Amen. Gail Wright. What's up, sister? Sister, what's your name on Clapper? Sister Gail. I've been trying to hunt you down. Amen, Chi Chi. Let's go. Praise God. Thank you, sister. I'm gonna add you as a mod. If you don't wanna be a mod, then don't worry about it, but I'm just trying to add people just so we got a few in here. Praise God. Here we go. This is a little different than the clapper. It seems, uh, I don't know. Oh, it's, it's you, Sister Deb. Okay, so yeah, I had you as Deborah. So anyway, thank you. And amen. I, I didn't know that that was you. Sister Lindsay's in the house. Praise God, everybody. We are almost there. We are almost there. It will auto save a replay copy. Yeah, look, I don't know what to do when this ends, so I didn't figure it out. <laughs> Hopefully, when I end it, I can post it and go from there. Hey Amen, we're about to study. Brother Steve is in the house. What's up, my man? Well, this is pretty cool. This is our debut on YouTube. It does it automatically? Oh, amen. Thank God, that just took pressure off. <laughs> Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. Listen, I, I got... I had 40 pages, so I asked you guys to pray for me. I know you were. I appreciate it, all of it, but but I've been scrambled. I, I had like four Bible studies all in one. I got completely overwhelmed. It's insane. So I had to tighten it up, edit it, tighten it up. Right up to the last minute, I was still doing this, so... Number one, I'll apologize if it doesn't flow. It should be good. I'm going to give you that typology. And so it just, I, I'm overwhelmed. I, I mean, I literally, it, it's just too long. I, I had so much stuff going. So I'm going to try to go through some of this quickly. And look, I'll, I'll try to look up every once in a while in case you got a question. If you got a real question, save it if I'm not looking up because your questions a lot of time trigger something in my brain and then we work it all out together, whatever. So all glory to God, praise God. Let's pray to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to lift up your name, lift up your holy word. 
Lord, we just want to glorify you. Your word will glorify you. I pray that you're with me. I speak the things you want me to speak and that every heart and mind receives this truth and tests it. We test all things. We're commanded to test. So in their heart, in their spirit, Holy Spirit testifying to their spirit like it did for me, Lord, all glory to you. I pray that people are blessed by this. So we lift up this study. We lift up this fellowship in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise God. All right. What's up, everybody? All right, we ready to rock? Everybody got Bibles out, ready to go? And listen, I tried to time this. This ended up being so long. So I, I am going to move quickly. And hopefully I can look up if something happens and you got a question. But look, it's all, I don't know, some stuff you'll obviously know, some stuff you won't. And we'll just have to figure it out. So I'm actually amped up, but I want it to go right. So listen. Did you guys know, anybody ever heard of the Jubilee, right? The Jubilee year? So there's no recorded Jubilee in the Bible. Did you know that? There's no recorded Jubilee in the Bible. So, you know, we got all the feasts, we got the history of Israel, all of it. There's no Jubilee. So... I just started, this was one of my gold rush trails. The Yom Kippur War was 1973. That's 50 years ago. And it even ended in October-ish. So I thought we're going to be raptured the next month. It could be the first real Jubilee. Everybody tries to figure out the Shemitahs, the Jubilees. Ultimately, we don't know. But I thought it was interesting that 1973, the Yom Kippur War, which they should have lost, by the way. They should have lost that war. Um, you know, the prime minister lady there, Golda Meir, she messed up, and God gave a mir miraculous victory there. So if that was a jubilee year, 1973, and listen, 1973 was 25 years after 1948. And Abraham was called out at 75. He had to wait until Isaac was born 25 years. So there was just numbers that matched up. And besides that, David Ben-Gurion died in 1973. And he's the original one. So I just thought there was, you know, some Kool-Aid in there, some juice. And I thought it was interesting. So praise God, our rapture next month could be the real jubilee never been recorded in the bible there's no jubilee recorded that they ever celebrated so it could be and we're going to circle back to what god gave me right before i push the button listen the lord's so good I, I just don't even know how to tell you all right praise god let's go i want to show you tonight quickly that god does want us to be date setters lukewarm pastors have just beat that out of us. Oh, you can't be a date setter. You can't be a date setter. Oh, you're a date setter. That's no good. That's no good. Oh, I won't set dates. I'm not setting a date. And we're all spooked by the date setting. I'm actually going to show you where God says we're to be date setters. If you can even believe that, you'll see it. Praise God. Let's go. All right. The seven letters to the seven churches are seven periods of church history. Most everybody should know that by now. Yeah, there's the Jubilee right there. And there's no recorded instance of them celebrating it, which is interesting. Okay, so, and listen, a lot of people say the seven letters are for the tribulation. I don't believe that because the Church of Philadelphia, we're the raptured church. So you can't already be in the tribulation, you know, unless it had some kind of dual meaning, which is possible. But uh, the other one, it gets a warning and says, you know, if you if you don't repent from being with Jezebel, I'm going to throw you into the great tribulation. 
So anyway, I think it's the period of church history, 2,000 years. So think with me a little bit. We're in the Laodicean period, correct? We're in the last period. So why God calls them lukewarm? Why are they lukewarm? Why are they lukewarm? Amen, brother. Because they're lukewarm about the return of Christ. They're lukewarm about eschatology. This is the church of the last days. This is the condition of the church right before the rapture, if you think of it that way. So the condition of the church right before God pulls the trigger is lukewarm. Something makes them lukewarm. It's eschatology. So that's my take on it. Now get this. Now I was going to read all this, but I'm going to move it along to do the quick version. Luke 19, 39 through 44. Okay, this is the triumphal entry. This is Zechariah 9, 9 when he rode in on the donkey. Okay, this is prophecy being fulfilled. If you remember the story, they said, Master, tell your disciples to keep quiet. He said what? If they keep quiet, the stones would cry out. So the reason the stones would cry out is because it was a prophetic command. In Zechariah 9.9, God said, shout for joy, rejoice, daughter of Zion. You know, your, your king comes to you riding on the, you know, the foal and the foal of an ass. The whole thing, it was a command. That's why Jesus said, if they weren't waving the palm branches, Hosanna in the highest, the rocks would have literally cried out because God's prophetic word always will be fulfilled. Jeremiah 1.12, God says, I watch over my word to perform it. That's a great scripture, Jeremiah 1.12. Now listen, the point of this story is this. It says Jesus looked at Jerusalem and he wept. So while he was weeping, he said, if you would have only known this day, this your day. Now, because they didn't know, he said, AD 70 was going to happen. Your temple will be destroyed. And how many people died? History books tell us over a million Jews died when that temple was destroyed. So their punishment for not knowing the time of the time of the Lord, the coming, the first coming of Christ was to be destroyed and be dispersed for 2,000 years. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. So this just dawned on me. Jesus wept because they didn't know. What's Jesus doing this time? He said, you're making me sick. You're making me sick. Think about it. Because you're neither hot nor cold, you're indifferent. Eschatology, yeah, it's not my thing. You know, listen, we're living at the end of the world. If this can't interest you in God's program, what will? God does not like the lukewarm. So he's not weeping this time. He said, you're making me sick. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Okay, so first coming, he wept. Second coming, the, the lukewarm make him sick, the ones that don't know. All right, now I was just going to read real quick. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. So make no mistake about it, the lukewarm church goes into the tribulation. They're the ones at the end, they don't make it. But look at verse 17, this really popped me. Verse 17, because you say, all words in red, this is Christ speaking, because you say, 
This is why they're lukewarm. This is what they're saying. I am rich. I'm increased with goods. I have need of nothing. Do you know when you have need of nothing, what are you saying? You're saying, I'm saved. Because that's the ultimate. Once you're saved, you could have all hell break loose on you, and it doesn't matter. You're saved. If you die in any situation as a Christian, you're saved. You will go be with the Lord. So that's what they were saying. I'm in need of nothing. I'm rich. So I looked up the word rich. Get this. Rich means rich in resources that you may give the blessings of salvation to all. So think about that. Rich in resources that you, you'll give the blessings of salvation to everybody. And what's everybody say that rails against me when I tell them they're not saved? Foaming at the mouth post-tribber, not saved. Rapture denier, not saved. Nobody knows the day or the hour, probably not saved. Um, I got a list here. Uh, buddy, give up on the rapture, honey. Just preach the gospel. They're indifferent, not saved. Clueless people, not saved. And here's, here's the big one that really catches traction, which I think matches up with this. God said, Jesus said, because you say. What's the famous line? It's not a salvation issue. It's not a salvation issue. Brother, you don't know. It's not a salvation issue. I can be a foaming at the mouth post-tribber. It's not a salvation issue. It's not a salvation issue. This is all I hear. So they think they're saved. Nothing's a salvation issue. We're going to find out eschatology really kind of is a salvation issue. So you can argue it still. We will find out in a month. In a month, we will find out. Praise God. Let's go. Let me make sure I got it all on it. Look, I'm going fast, but I'm going to try to go slow fast, if that makes any sense. Oh, the good news. So let me give let me give all those people that I think are going in the tribulation, let me give you actual true good news. Jesus said, because you say I'm rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, know you not. Listen, they say they're rich and don't need anything. Jesus says, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Somebody has to be the lukewarm church. Who is it? He's not talking about Catholicism. Catholicism's already out. They're not the church. This is the seven letters to the seven churches, the ones that have real Christians in them. So these lukewarm people have to be identified somewhere. Who are they? I think it's the foaming at the mouth post tribber. And look, I'm not really picking on anybody. Believe it or not, I'm trying to help you. But the comment section of, of my videos are still, you know, it's not pre-trib, it's not pre-trib. Amos 5.18, you guys never answer Amos 5.18, never. You never even comment on it every time I type it in. Woe to you that desire the day of the Lord. It's a day of darkness, not of light. You got no answer for that. You just go back to what you think. All right, here's your good news. Jesus said, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. You're going into the fire. Tribulation, day of the Lord is fire judgment, not water, fire that you may be rich, that you may have white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do, does not appear. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. I, I'm baffled how people can't see. All right, here's 19. Here's the good news. As many as I love, and look, I never caught this before. As many as I love, I rebuke... I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. Now, did you catch that? Baptism's not necessary for salvation, no. It's a good thing, but you don't get saved by baptism. So he said repent. The only people that ever have to repent are unsaved people. Repent means change your mind change your direction. We've we've lessened it down to mean, oh, I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for my sins. No, repent means change your mind about who Christ is and what he did. He did the whole thing. So praise God. 
He loves you. So when you go into the tribulation, listen, there's going to be hundreds of millions of tribulation saints. I think it's going to be a lot of the lukewarm church. So I hope that makes sense. It was, you know, ultimately encouraging. <laughs> Praise God. Here we go. All right. On to the prophecy. What does God say about his word, his prophets, his mysteries, his story, his future? And listen, you guys, sometimes we all get bogged down when we open the Bible and we don't know what to read or we pick a random scripture, all that. You got to look at the Bible as a whole. This is a 6,000 year period. If you rise above that and kind of view it like you're up above a parade, look at the story. So if you randomly open to the book of Habakkuk, you would say, okay, when did he live? Who was he writing to? Were they in exile? Were they going into exile? Are, are they in their homeland? Are they split nations? You know, this is, you got to look at the whole story, which we're going to do tonight in the greatest typology of all time. I'm telling you, this is the culmination of typology. I'm convinced of it. You test it, you pray about it, it'll be up between you and God. Okay, I won't turn there because it's a familiar scripture. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, God says, I'm God, there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. Now listen, we all know about Rock Island books, okay? Um the Bereshit prophecy. So that's all gold. It's 100%. It's amazing. But I'm telling you, this this is a also 100% true. God said, I declare the end from the beginning. What's the beginning of the redemption story? Think about it. It's Abraham, Sarah, Isaac. So God declared the end, the end of the story from the beginning of the redemption story. And look, the typology is going to prove it. So praise God. I want you to think in those terms. Now, Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, see that you do it not. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, get this, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So what does that mean? It means the spirit and purpose of all prophecy is to testify of Jesus. Did you catch that? So the angel is saying, I have the testimony of Jesus. And then he said, uh, they, uh, they have the testimony of Jesus. I am your fellow servant of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Listen, this whole book is prophecy. Dr. Berry said that many times. It's exactly right. The whole book is kind of typology. There's a ton of typology in there. It all points to the future and what will be with God in the end, which is my other revelation. I, I don't even know if we get to that tonight. Maybe we do. It, we got we got ground to cover. Okay, so praise God. The spirit and purpose of all prophecy is to testify of Jesus. Listen, no other religion in the world, all their holy books, they don't have prophecy. They, they don't have this story. They don't have a savior. They don't have, you know, all the creation and everything. So prophecy proves Christ. It testifies. Testify means give proof or evidence. So again, if you're not into eschatology, what are you saying? You don't care about the return of Christ? Think about this. People say, I'm a born-again Christian. I'm just trying to live a life. I, I want to have a house, a white picket fence, kids, grandkids. Okay, God knows all that. That's good. But you're in the end times. You're in the end times. You have to be interested. If you're not interested, you're lukewarm. So eschatology is everything, especially we're a month away. We're a month away from this. Oh, praise God. And listen, 
everything I say, I'll just qualify it. Everything I say could technically be wrong. I don't think it is. I don't, but we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Listen, you guys know about Amos 3.7. God does nothing but reveals his secrets to his prophets first. So you know that one. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. I love this one, so I'm going to turn to this one. Listen, do, do you know what this is? This is Nebuchadnezzar. He had a dream. Do you know what he said to his wise men? He said, I'm not even going to tell you the dream. You have to tell me what I dreamed and the interpretation of it. You guys remember that story? So they looked at him and said, you're crazy. Nobody can do that. Nobody can do that. Well, there was a guy that could do it because he had a God that could do it. Daniel chapter 2, verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show to the king. But there is a God in heaven, praise God, that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed are these. Praise God. So <laughs> even Nebuchadnezzar's dream that he told nobody, God told Daniel the dream, the interpretation. God, Listen, God's inside every brain. Eight billion people on this planet. He's recording every single thought we think. If you can believe that, he absolutely is every single thought. He's in every single person's computer inside their skull. These are amazing thoughts. Okay, check this one out. This one doesn't get a lot of play for whatever reason. This is Hosea chapter 12, verse 10. Look what it says. God speaking words in red. I have also spoken by the prophets. I have multiplied visions and used similitudes. I've used figures of speech, typology by the ministry of the prophets. Listen, if God's using typology, that is a hidden truth to be searched out diligently. That's what it means. God's, listen, does anybody like a mystery movie in here? Seriously, think about it. God gave us these greatest hidden mysteries to be dug out. It's, we're supposed to do it. The lukewarm church, oh, you can't set a date. Nobody knows the day or the hour. And it will never know. Could be 100 years from now. Could be 500 years from now. This is all nonsense. This is all nonsense. Praise God. All right, that was Hosea 12.10. Now let's go to Galatians, uh, our stomping grounds, where all this came to light. So this is in our chapter where, you know, I learned about the barren women and the whole thing. Galatians 4.24. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which leads to bondage, which is Hagar. That word allegory is a one-time use in the whole New Testament. When God uses a word once, maybe twice, maybe even three times, it's a, it's a flag of, hey, something's here. God only uses this word once. Allegory. We know what an allegory means. It's a story, a, a poem, a picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning. God plainly told us Mount Sinai and the two sons, the one of the slave, the one of promise, is an allegory. We were to dig it out. Praise God. I'm telling you. So th this is this is what you got to keep in mind when we're hunting the rapture and people try to rail against us. You're not supposed to be doing this. All right, now listen. 
I got to take five or 10 minutes and give you guys something that most of you maybe never heard of. I pray that you have heard of it. If you've heard of this, just kind of raise your hand, say yes or whatever. I don't know if you can see this book. Hidden Prophecies in the Psalms. That verse down there is Psalm 49.9. Okay? This woman's name is Patricia Berry of Oklahoma City. J.R. Church wrote this book back in the 80s. That woman, Patricia Berry, discovered one of the most amazing revelations easily of our time. You've heard of it? So in the Psalms, the Psalms match up with the years starting in the 1900s, okay? So 1901 is Psalm 1. Psalm 120 is our year 2020. COVID-19, what happened to this world, is in Psalm 120. I'm telling you. So the Bible says, if you're going to boast, boast in the Lord. I'm going to boast in the Lord that when I found this information out, he gave me the fervor to dig it out. I'm watching all World War I documentaries. World War II, the Holocaust, it's in the Psalms. Psalm 39 right up to Psalm 49, which is on this book. Now, this book back in the 80s, J.R. Church did the best he could. He had no way of knowing what we know now. No, the rapture is in Psalm 122. The rapture is in Psalm 122. So part of the mystery is, listen, when I, I'm telling you, I dug this out. I did all the World War II Psalms. I did um, all our Psalms from 120. And listen, Pastor Sandy was on this a little bit, but he never dug it out. He never dug it out. So people I knew knew about this, but again, Nobody dug it out. I dug it out. So the Psalms of Ascent go from 120 to Psalm 134. Now I'm telling you, Psalm 134 is the feast. It's the marriage feast of us and our bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be in the new millennial temple having the marriage feast of the Lamb in Psalm 134. So I just got right to the point. I'm not going to break it down. I've been, I'd studied this for months. So my, my family study group is in here. A lot of them, they can testify to this. We did it all. We dug it all out. But Psalm 122 is the rapture. So listen, I'm, I'm going to give you an example. Psalm 46, 9, 46, 9 says, he causes wars to cease. Well, World War II ended in 1945. So that's would be Psalm 45, but it's a look back. So the rapture is such a big deal, God gave the warning and put it in 122. And listen, 123 only has four verses. So when we get raptured next month, God still has a half a year to start the tribulation. And what does Psalm 123 say? It says, O oh, you that dwell in the heavens, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. The Jews will know that they missed it. They missed this huge monumental event because only God could pull off the rapture. They'll know it's their God. Not the unbelieving Jews, but the remnant. So I'm telling you, dig that out for yourself. They match up with the years. 120, 121, 122, we went through all of it. Listen, Psalm 125 gives a warning to don't take the mark of the beast because the mark of the beast will be toward the end of Psalm 126, which is the year 2026. So because of these Psalms, I know we have to be raptured. So I, I should do a video on it still. I meant to do a video on the Psalm study, but check this out. Psalm 49.4. Let me turn to it even. 
I mean, yeah. So I'm, I'm just doing this one, but all right. The Jews came back into the land in 1948. Yes or no, we know that's a fact. They became a state. The state of Israel is born May 14th, 1948. Now get this. So when I'm trying to figure out the fig tree generation, when does that fig tree start? You know, 1948, nobody knew. I dug it out. So 1948, Psalm 48, God said, look at this. Walk about Zion, go round about her, and count the towers thereof. Do you know what the towers were for? The towers are lookout towers. They're lookout towers because that's what they did if they were in war. So when they saw the enemy coming, remember, Jerusalem's up on a mountain. It's raised up. So they had lookout towers for war. God said, walk about her, count the towers. Literally, listen to me, less than 24 hours, the Jews were in a war. They had five nations come against them. May 15th, 1948. This is how we figured out that the fig tree didn't start in 1948. Nothing could bloom. Nothing could be green. They were fighting for their life. If they would have lost that war, the Jews wouldn't have had a state again. They wouldn't have had a homeland. They would have been gone. That would have been it. So God, God said, walk about her, count the towers, because war's coming. War's coming. Now look at this. And people have been on this before. Um, I've heard Pastor Sandy, Dr. Barry talk about this. Verse 13, Psalm 48, mark you well her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generation following. So when we read that, we don't, we don't think much of it. Tell it to the generation following. The word following means last generation. It's the last generation. Jesus said, Haraho, ha, suke, behold the fig tree. When you see the fig tree, this is when it starts. But look at this. Look at Psalm 49. I went the long way, but praise God. Psalm 49, after he brought the Jews into the land, look at this. Psalm 49, verse 1. Hear this, all you people, give ear, all you inhabitants of the world. God's making an announcement to the world. Do you get this? That's exactly what it means. Hear this, all you people, give ear, all you inhabitants of the world. Listen, that war ended March 10th, 1949. They won it miraculously. They were led into the United Nations in May of 1949. That's when the fig tree shoots forth. So 1949, add the 80 years, it's 2029. Add the 81st year, it's 2030. So Christ will come back with Jesus in the year 2030, right before it turns to 81. That's all it has to be. Jesus said the generation won't pass away till all is fulfilled. So it didn't start in 1950. It didn't start in 1948. It started in 1949. That's what that means. And I still haven't even got to the good part. <laughs> Hear this, all you people. Give ear, all you inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. What that really means is God wants you to understand what he's about to say. Here's the verse, verse four. I will incline my ear to a parable. What that really means, I'm telling you, I dug it out, dig it out. It, it, it means God's telling us, incline your ear. I'll open your ear to a parable, a truth, a hidden truth. So open your ear to a parable. I will open my dark sayings upon the harp. That is one of the most brilliant things in all of scripture. They put it on the front of this book, 49.4, I will open my dark sayings upon a harp. Now, Dark sayings sounds evil or spooky or whatever. That's not what it means. So 
God, it means enigma. The word, when you look it up, it means an enigma, a riddle, a puzzle. God said, I'm going to open up my puzzles on the harp. What are the Psalms? What are the Psalms? The Psalms are songs. They sang these songs. So they played it on the harp and sang the Psalms while they're playing the harp. So God said, I'm going to open up my enigmas, my mysteries, my puzzles in the Psalms. That's what it means. Praise God. And so I, I'm telling you, once I learned this, I went in there and dug it out. Uh, and, and look, not all 150 Psalms, but I'm telling you, I found, I found that wedding feast. It's in Psalm 134. Listen, I found this other one. I'm just going to give it to you because it's on top of my head. <laughs> Listen to this. Remember Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You remember that? Look at this. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, test this. It's all foolproof. Look at Psalm 131, 131, right after we come back. We come back, there's stuff to do. You got sheep, goats, you got wheat, tares, you, you got stuff going on. So Psalm 139, look at this. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Look what it says. Let Israel hope in the Lord from hereafter and forever. Do you get that? They became like a child. It's the only way they go into the kingdom of heaven. So they literally became like a child. And they said, listen, I, this stuff's over my head. I've become like a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord forevermore from this point. It's the millennial kingdom. And listen, I mean, I should keep going with the Psalms. I didn't plan on any of this. I was not going to fully go into the Psalms, but now I have to. Praise God. Father, I love you. This is amazing. So listen, I'm going to go quickly. Psalm 132. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into my tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. I won't give sleep to my eyes until I find out a place for the Lord, a habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. So Psalm 132, 20, 32, that's a reference to we have to build the millennial temple. Now, I don't know who's going to build it. Could be the Jews, could be could be us in our glorified bodies. So that's 2032. The climax is 134. I'm going to read it to you. Three verses. Look what it says. Behold, bless you the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, which by night. Why did God put that in there? which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord that made heaven and earth bless you out of Zion. So picture this. This is nighttime. When God comes back, the book of Revelation says he's going to make mountains and remove mountains. This mountain in Israel is going to go way up. We're going to build the millennial temple way up high on the mountain. And when all the people during the millennium have to come there and worship, they're going to see this glorious temple sitting up on a mountain. But better than that, this night, it said nighttime, a wedding feast is at night. So we will be in this temple, literally, literally, We'll be there lifting up our hands, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ in the new temple at night in the year 2034 when it gets finished and built. 
praising him, and that'll be the start of the wedding feast of the Lamb. Could it be wrong? I guess it could, but I'm telling you, I believe it 100%. Praise God. So these are the type of things I dug out. Now, I just want you to see the word enigma, dark sayings. It's only 17 times in the Old Testament, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you one in the book of Daniel. This is Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. Now, look at We got to think about things. We got to let it sink in. Daniel 8, 23, it says, And in the latter time, in the latter time of their kingdom, their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to a full, in the heat of evil of the tribulation, a king of fierce countenance, the Antichrist, indwelt by Satan, all of it. A king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sayings shall stand up. It's the same word. So think about it. Who would know the enigmas, the mystery of God. Now, I think the Antichrist is going to be Judas, the seed of Satan, somehow. So think about it. Ultimately, it could be a reference to Satan because Satan walked with the Lord. He knows a lot of the mysteries. So when he speaks to the people, they're going to worship him and say, who's like this dude? Who's like the beast? Who can make war with the beast? Why? Because he knows the mysteries of, you know, ancient times from the beginning of creation. So that's that word. Now, I won't turn to it, but one other reference of that word is 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1. Remember when Queen Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and she had to come? The Bible says she asked him every question that was in her heart. Hard questions. That's the enigma all the mysteries, and it said Solomon answered them all. So when she left, she said, I didn't even know the half of it, of Solomon's wisdom, which God gave him supernaturally. So that's that word. But listen, here's the kicker. I said all that to say this. When you look up the Hebrew word enigma, in the definition, it says this. Something to be guessed at. Look it up. That's what it says. When God gives us a mystery, a puzzle, an enigma, something to figure out, it's to be guessed at. So listen, if you're a true date setter, you can't be a date setter unless you study. You, you say, I'm coming up with this date. Here's why. Boom, 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 boom. So that's how you do it. That's how you do it. And God wants us to do it. That's the point. Praise God. Let's go. Oh, we got a lot. We got a lot to cover. All right. Now listen, we're going to shift gears a little bit. So this one, I went for 20 hours and then I got bogged down. And this is when I was asking you guys to pray for me. So I'm giving the shortest version possible and it'll be short, but Look at this. This is what I did a whole, it's not exhaustive by any means. So this is not going to be perfect. Stuff could be added to this. But I wanted to look up what all the prophets of the Old Testament. So remember, there's writing prophets, Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. They wrote Holy Scripture. God used them. There's writing prophets, and then there's prophets like Elijah and Elisha, who were prophets of Israel, but they didn't write any of the Bible. So I'm looking at the writing prophets. So the birth of Christ, all the, all the major events, not all of them, but a good list. So which prophets saw the birth of Christ, wrote about the birth of Christ? And listen, I got that word saw stuck in my head. Isaiah had visions, Ezekiel had visions, Daniel had visions, Amos had visions, a bunch of them had visions, not all of them did. So when I say saw, 
I mean, they wrote about it. So, and some of them actually did see it. So I just got that word saw stuck in my head. The birth of Christ, Moses wrote about it. Isaiah wrote about it. Micah wrote about it. And Jeremiah wrote about when Herod killed all the babies when he tried to kill Christ. So that was at the time of the birth, but he wrote about something different about the babies being killed by Herod, which by the way, is the 144,000. You wanna know who the 144,000 are? It's all the babies that Herod killed. I can prove it right out of Jeremiah 31, 15 through 17. Look it up yourself. Maybe I can do a video on the 144,000. That's who the 144,000 are. Praise God, let's go. Okay, that's the birth of Christ. The cross of Christ. Isaiah, Daniel, Zechariah. Now, this was interesting, and I don't even know if it's fully true, but basically, if you look this up, no prophet, no prophet saw the church. No prophet saw the church age. And really kind of one of the closest would be Joel, right? Because people argue with me about Joel, you know, dream dreams, visions, word of the Lord's, all this. That's the prophecy of Joel. We're supposed to do it. That was partially fulfilled because the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament would come on people and leave, come on people and leave. Well, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit sealed you forever. John 14, 16 says he'll be with us forever. So that was the difference of the partial fulfillment of Joel. But anyway, he didn't see the church. His prophecy just coincided with the day of Pentecost. So that's all I wanted to say there. All right, the destruction of the temple. Now, of course, Christ said the destruction of the temple, but Daniel saw the destruction of the temple in AD 70. So think about that. Daniel experienced the first one. He went into exile in Babylon, and he wrote about the next one. And of course, Daniel saw all the world kingdoms. Okay, this is a big one. Jews scattered and regathered. Scattered and regathered. This is a big deal. God said, I'm going to scatter you. They were gone for 2,000 years. He said, I'll regather you. So there's all kinds of scripture about the scatter. There's all kinds of scripture about the uh, regather. Jesus talked about it in Luke 21, 24, uh, that they would be scattered throughout all the nations, the ones that escaped. Remember, a million people died, a little over a million in the AD 70 destruction of the temple. Okay, the scattering and regathering was Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Moses, Isaiah, Amos, okay? The rapture, who wrote about the rapture? Now we know Isaiah did, Micah did, David did in the Psalms, Hosea, possibly Hosea, and, and look, it could be more. This is not exhaustive. Um, who, wrote, who, who wrote about the Antichrist? Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, and the Psalms. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. This is, listen, this is the whole, do you guys realize the day of the Lord is the culmination of everything? It is. And I'm going to tell you why. 6,000 years of God's human history where he lets the fallen angels and Satan rule this world. Evil men by them rule this world. This is the culmination, the day of the Lord, God saying, it stops now. I'm going hands on. And he does the seven years but you've got to look at it that. So the day of the Lord was prophesied all through the Old Testament. Joel, Isaiah, Daniel, Hosea, Ezekiel, Zechariah. Armageddon was talked about by Joel, Zephaniah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Isaiah. I mean, look what these guys wrote about. I love this. The second coming, Isaiah, Zechariah, Daniel, uh, Malachi, 
unbelievable. Isaiah also, Isaiah wrote about a ton. You know, the book of Isaiah mirrors the Bible, right? There's 66 chapters in Isaiah. There's 66 book, books in the Bible. So I heard that a long time ago. That's basically true. It kind of mirrors the whole Bible. So Isaiah saw a ton. Okay. Now get this. This one is the most. This one is the most. The millennium, the kingdom of God. Who saw the kingdom of God? And listen again, not exhaustive because I don't know the whole Bible, not even close. So it could be in spots that we never even thought to look. The millennium, Joel, Amos, Micah, Isaiah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Haggai, 10 prophets wrote about the kingdom of God on earth. This is why the Jews been waiting for the kingdom. This is why the disciples said, Lord, at this time, you're going to set up the kingdom. They wanted the kingdom. Listen, they had a conundrum. They saw Isaiah 53. Christ had to die a horrible death for us, and yet they saw the glory. He's going to reign from the throne of David, you know, in a glorious fashion in the kingdom of God on earth. So a lot of Jews back then thought there was two messiahs. They didn't know how to jive it, but look, that was part of that was part of God blinding Israel. So he gave them stuff they couldn't figure out. Praise God. Okay, so that's a big deal. Listen, who saw the millennial temple? The temple, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Haggai, and the Psalms, and the Psalms. So whoever wrote that Psalm 134, I don't even know. I didn't even look at it. Whoever it was, could have been David, could have been somebody. Listen, there's a lot of no-name writers in the Bible. In case anybody didn't know that, we have Holy Scripture that made it into the canon where, you know, we don't know who wrote it, like, like Hebrews say. But there's a lot of books like that, Psalms like that. And listen, let me, I forgot to tell you this. The Psalms matching up with the years, get this. Psalms is the 19th book of the Bible. It's the 19th book of the Bible. Somebody had to put that in order. And listen to this. Out of the 150 Psalms, they're not chronological. They're not chronological. Psalm 2 talks about the tribulation, the, the destruction, God laughing at their calamity. When their calamity comes, he said, I'm going to laugh at them because he's judging them. That's Psalm 2. So it's not chronological, which means God had to make man put it in his perfect order so he could match up the 1900s and the 2000s with his incredible book of Psalms. Listen, that's a miracle. That's a monster revelation, the book of Psalms. Praise God. Okay, last one. Who, which prophet, pop quiz, pop quiz, which prophet saw the furthest? Which prophet saw the furthest? wrote about the furthest. There's two of them. One in the New Testament, kind of obvious, but the one in the Old Testament. Pop quiz, who's got it? Who's got it? Daniel, no. Isaiah, there's the winner right there, right? Listen, Isaiah 65, 17. Isaiah said, the new heavens and the new earth. This is after the millennium. So Isaiah saw, wrote about the new heaven and new earth. And of course, I saw you guys put John up there. Of course, John saw it. John saw it all. John saw amazing things and wrote the book of Revelation. So John and Isaiah, one from each testament, if you will, saw the new heaven and the new earth in the ages of ages. And listen, that was, the, that was the other revelation God gave me about what we're going to be in eternity, people. you got to hear me. This is the greatest time to be alive. It's coming. It will... God blew my mind that night. And this is stuff we already know, but it hit me like a hundredfold. So I don't know if we get to that tonight. Maybe we do, but we'll figure it out. Praise God. Let's go.
All right, so that's what the prophets saw, right? So think about what they wrote about. Now, let's go to this scripture that, listen, I kick myself, you know, when I argue with people, I always forget about this, and I don't know why. This this is absolute gold. This is the, the defense of rapture watching, date setting, all of it. Now, I showed you, God said, I'll give you enigmas, Enigma in the definition is something to be guessed at. Something to be guessed at. So we know we're in the will of God when we're tracking the rapture feverishly. Okay, check this out. This is 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read 3 through 12. I'm not going to break it down crazy, but a little bit. And again, I, I, I broke all this stuff down. I'm, I'm, I really am doing the quick version because it's just too long. So praise God. First Peter chapter one, starting at verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away. Look at this, reserved in heaven for you, reserved in heaven. So when people say to me, hey, dude, forget the rapture, just preach the gospel. This is reserved in heaven the good news is we're going to be like God. We're going to have a glorified body, not to trudge down here on the earth and grind it out. Yeah, it starts as good news here, but the ultimate good news is being raptured, making it with the Lord. It's reserved in heaven. That's what Peter said. So you've got to think about stuff. Verse 5, look at this. Now, this is really amazing. Who are kept by the power of God through faith, we know that, to salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. How is that misunderstood? How is that misunderstood? It's reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith to salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's when it's revealed. When we go, it's revealed next month. This is upon us, people. Verse six pertains perfectly. Wherein you greatly rejoice. Are we not greatly rejoicing in this fact? We're alive at the end. This is crazy. This is a miracle. Wherein you greatly rejoice Though now for a season, get this, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Peter knew, the Holy Spirit knew, we got to grind out life. We're rejoicing for the rapture, but as long as we're here, we get manifold temptations. It makes perfect sense. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. This is all gold. Whom having not seen, we haven't seen him yet, you love. We love him. In whom though now you see him not, we don't see him, said it twice, Yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I mean, how much better can that be? Look at that scripture. Verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. People, I'm trying to tell you the rapture is the good news. You receive the end of your faith, the result of your faith. And listen, I, I got to say this. People that say it's not a salvation issue, it's not a salvation issue, it's not a salvation issue. 1 Corinthians 15, 2 says you can believe in vain. Do you know what that word vain means? It means without effect. It means without purpose. 
with, it means without effort. So think about it. If you're just sitting back like the lukewarm church, I'm in need of nothing. I'm saved. It's not a salvation issue. I don't have to look for the Lord. Who cares? He'll come 500 years from now. I'm telling you, it's dangerous ground. I'm here to warn you. You got a month to repent. Post-tribbers, repent. Rapture deniers, repent. Please repent of that and believe on the Lord. He's coming. Okay, now I read all that, which is gold, but here's the point. Verse 10 and 11. <laughs> of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace, grace that should come to you. So the prophets who wrote about it inquired and searched diligently. Verse 11, searching what, comma, that means into. Searching into is a better translation of that word. Searching into or what manner of time, time. They were searching the time of these prophecies. I never use this when I argue people about hunting for the rapture. All right, let me restart. Searching what? Searching into or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. They got signals as to the time that this would happen. When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that should follow. Do you see that? The prophets who wrote this stuff said, man, looks like he's suffering in Isaiah 53, 52, all of it. But looks like he's got glory over here. Look what these scriptures say, the millennial kingdom, the temple, new heaven, new earth. They were trying to figure it out. People, we're in good company. We're with the Daniels, the Jeremiah's, the Ezekiel's. This is what it means. The prophets were trying to figure out the timing. Oh, all glory to God. When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Verse 12, to whom it was revealed, not to themselves. It never ultimately was revealed to them. Paul or Peter says, but to us, they did minister the things which are now reported to you by them that have preached the gospel to you. This is all the good news with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Now get this line, which things the angels desire to look into. Now, how many people have heard a, a pastor say, look, even the elect angels want to know about salvation. They're interested in salvation and the timing and the glory. They're interested in this. All I had to do, all I had to do is look up one word and realize it's not the elect angels they're talking about. This is the fallen angels. Everybody still with me? So at the end it says, the Holy Ghost which was sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. That word desire means lust after, long for, covet it, covet it. So think about it. It's the fallen angels. The fallen angels are looking at the timing of all this and this glorious thing called salvation. Think about it. The fallen angels are longing for salvation. Does this mean they realized they screwed up? They're looking at it like, why did we foul Lucifer? Why did we foul that boob? Why did we leave the glorious heaven of God? to foul, and look what these guys are getting. Look what these guys are getting. Salvation, glory, riches, one with Christ. <clears throat> Pre 
Praise God. So ultimately, I think they regret it. Uh, all right, listen, I'm, I'm just going to make one point. The word that says the prophets searched diligently, that's a one-time use, and it means searched anxiously. They inquired, it means crave, crave. It means investigate, seek out, search for, crave, search anxiously. This is what the Old Testament prophets did when they wrote the word of God, the holy word of God, and they didn't know what it meant, and they searched it, searched it, searched it. The timing, everything. So praise God, we're in good company. I wanted you guys to know that. It is a 100% fact. It's right there. First Peter chapter 1. Let's go. Okay. The day of the Lord is the culmination of God's history. I said that with mankind. It is the end of Satan's reign. It's He's done. So that's why it's the pinnacle, because Satan and his fallen angels will be done. Now, I know Satan's loosed at the end of the millennium, and that's just to weed out the people who didn't want to be ruled with a rod of iron. So remember, people are still sinners in the millennium. That's what's going to happen. He looses just Satan, rounds him up, and it's over. And listen, I'm saying this, this discovery that God allowed me to have with the barren women, I, I'm saying it's the, it's the culmination of all typology. I'll present it, and I want to say this. People, I just got this a few days ago, the whole thing. If you want to be blessed by God, open your Bible, go to every one of these stories. I guarantee, I guarantee, amen, brother, I guarantee there's more nuggets in there. God will give you revelation. I have not fully dug this out. I got the outline of it. I'm telling you, this is the scenario. Okay, praise God. Okay, before we get started on that, I, I got to take you down this little trip right here. Okay, the Shunammite woman. I hope you guys all saw my video. The Shunammite woman. I, I, I wanted to contrast that. I was going to do a video on it, but you got to see this. So the Shunammite son died. Elisha laid on him, right? The to and fro. I did that on my last video. Seven sneezes, I believe, represents the whole church age. Seven letters to the seven churches. Seven sneezes we get a glorified body. I believe that's what it means. Let me contrast that with you. If you remembered on my video, I said uh, Isaiah 57, three, I said, hold on to that and I'll explain it. This is where I want to go with it. So we got to take 10 minutes on this. Turn to 1 Samuel. No, it's not 1 Samuel. First Kings. I wrote First Samuel for some reason. All right, First Kings seventeen. First Kings chapter seventeen, and this is gold. I want you to think about it. I want you to test it. Okay. So here's the comparison. God took Elijah and Elisha. So in the typology, it looks like, uh, you know. Elijah is obviously the prophet of Israel, even though Elisha was also a prophet to Israel, he represents in the typology our prophet because of the Shunammite woman. So, 1 Kings, and I really did write Samuel, I don't know why, let me just scratch that. All right, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17, see that's easy to remember. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath in him. So the widow's son dies. And look, we know this story. Jesus referenced it. And she said to Elijah, 
What have I to do with you, O man of God? Are you come to me to call my sin, to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? So think about that. The Shunammite story, Elisha, the Bible says it was a great woman. She was a great woman. Now listen, you'll miss that in the reading. Watch this. It says, it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house. That's what it says. You would go right by that and think nothing of it. I look up the word mistress. The word mistress is four times in the whole Old Testament. It means sorceress, sorceress, witchcraft, harlotry, the whole thing. So that's the connection with Isaiah 53. Hold on, let me just pull it up real quick. Or Isaiah 57.3. Isaiah 57, 3, look what God says right after the rapture. But draw near here, you sons of the sorceress. It's the same word, only four usages. So look at the typology is Israel played the whore. She's the sorceress, all of it. And listen, just so you know, I'll say it. Nahum chapter 3, verse 4. That's where you want to turn to, and it gives the whole shot of witchcraft, sorceress, and Saul. Maybe that's why I wrote it down. The, the story of Saul when he went to the medium. Do you remember that? The witch of Endor. She was a sorceress. So that's three of the usages. Isaiah 57 um, Nahum 3, and then the Saul story, okay? So Israel's portrayed as the sorceress, the harlot. We're portrayed as the great woman because Christ makes Ooh. us great. So I want you to see God is doing a analogy, comparing two things, or a, a similitude. A similitude is comparing two things. This is absolutely true, but get this part. Okay, so she said, are you coming to call out my sin? There's no sin with the great woman. There's no sin with the great woman of the, the Shunammite. So he, he, he said to her, give me your son. Okay. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into the loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. He Ooh. cried to the Lord. He cried to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? Now get this. Here's the part I want you to get. And he stretched himself, just like Elisha stretched himself on the Shunammite son. Elijah did it first. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray you, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child, brought him down out of the chamber into the house, delivered him to his mother, and Elijah said, See, your son lives. The woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Listen, the boy sneezed seven times. That represents the rapture, the church, the whole thing. Why three times did he stretch himself on the boy? This is my theory. You can test it. Three times, the Lord appeared to the Israelites, the Jews, on Mount Sinai. That was the presence of the Lord on the mountain. They heard the voice of God. You know the story. That was one time. The next time is the coming of Christ, the first coming. They rejected him and put him on the cross. The third time will be the, the second coming three times, 
and then they will believe that the word of the Lord is true out of his mouth, Zechariah 12, 10, on the day of atonement, that will be fulfilled and they will believe in him. So does that make sense? You got typology in the Elijah story three times. What's up, brother? So the seven sneezes and the three times, this is typology. This means something. So I wanted you guys to get that. That, that was part of this story, figuring it out. So Elisha had the great woman. Elijah had the sorceress. Right, I might need that one later. Praise God. Let's go. All right, here we go. I'm going to try to give this to you straight. So here's, here's a, oh man, Lord, help me do this. Is every, is everybody up to speed on Genesis 1814? Isaac's birth was an appointed time at the time of life. I found that with Galatians 4.28 when Paul said, um, we are like Isaac, we're the children of promise. So then I matched it up. And then when you look at it and you see the Shunammite, so stay with me, the Shunammite son, the no-name woman, the no-name son also was born at an appointed time in the time of life. So two times the Shunammite, two times for Isaac. That's a match. Well, when I looked at the rest of the barren women, I didn't see anything. I didn't see the match. So I, I just you know couldn't figure it out. So I thought, okay, we got the rapture. That makes sense. The Shunammite, Isaac, the whole thing. Listen, Isaiah 54, 1, God said, rejoice, O barren one. Rejoice, you who never travailed. You're finally going to give birth. Revelation 12, 5, it's a birth. It's a rapture. We know all this. So I'm sitting in the chair the other night, and then I get flooded with the rest of the typology. This is what I was scratching on the paper. And again, right before I pushed this button, God gave me one more thing. So I gotta tell you, God, the, God started this off. I went to bed, I don't know, months ago, a couple months ago. I went to bed, it was like two in the morning and all of a sudden in my head, I'm thinking, why was Isaac's birth an appointed time? That doesn't make any sense. God called Abraham out at 75 years old. He made him wait 25 years. He could have been born at any time. They're hanging out in the desert, doing the whole thing. Why did it have to be an appointed time? This is the thought that led me down the trail. Shadow for sure. Listen, the superheroes, the Eternals, that's, that's going to be all the fallen angels. When they come to earth, that's how they're going to get looked at, like all the Marvel movies and stuff, which I don't even watch, but I heard about the title of the Eternals. My son told me about it, all that. All right, so listen to me. And again, this can be dug out more. So if you want a revelation from God, I'm telling you something's going to be there. Listen, I wish we were in a room right now where I could hear your voices and talk back because this is so gold, I'm telling you. Okay, Sarah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac. Sarah was barren. God did the barren women because it's the greatest typology of all. All this typology is the culmination of God's 6,000 years, and it starts with the rapture. So the son of promise was born at the appointed time in the time of life. God just gave this to me before I pushed the button. So I had all the rest of it from the other night. His birth had to be an appointed time because the rapture is an appointed time. Do you get that? Listen, Esau and Jacob, there's no appointed time. 
Joseph, there's no appointed time. Samson, there's no appointed time. Samuel, there's no appointed time. John the Baptist, there's no appointed time. Who's the two appointed times? Sarah, Isaac, and the Shunammite woman. She's the seventh. So listen to me. Sarah starts it off. Isaac starts it off. We get raptured in a month. We get raptured in a month. The next barren woman is Rebecca. Rebecca had Esau and Jacob. God turns his attention back to the Jews. Does he not? They're going to go in as two nations again. The two-thirds that will worship the Antichrist and the one-third that God will save ultimately as a remnant. Think about that. I, I got to make sure I got all of it. Listen, this just dawned on me. Esau, Esau never went into Egypt. It was Jacob and his family, the 70. So who's the next child? Joseph. So Rachel was barren, and now you got Joseph. Who's the type of Christ? Joseph. Jesus will save the remnant, the third, the Jacob side, in the tribulation. What did Joseph do? He saved his family from what? A seven-year famine. So Sarah, Isaac, were gone. Rapture. Enter the 70th week of Daniel. The Jews go in as Esau and Jacob. Who shows up? Joseph. Christ, the real Christ, will show up and he'll provide a place for him in the wilderness. Praise God. Listen, there's so much more to it. I am doing the quick version. Let me look down. Oh, all glory to God. Listen, Esau gave up his birthright. The two-thirds are going to give up what was rightfully theirs. They were Jews. They were the chosen people. They're giving up their birthright. So that's plays into the story. I'm telling you, this is the greatest scenario typology for end times. And listen, I'm telling you, there's more to it. So here, here's the other one. You, you got, I, I should read this. Where do I got this written down? Oh man, I must have it on another sheet. Hold on, Genesis 25. Let me check Genesis 25. I want to read some of this. I hope this is it. Oh no, that, that's about the birth of Esau and Jacob. Oh, where did I get that written down? Okay, Genesis 46. Praise God, let's go. I'm telling you, there's so much more to this. I just got this a few days ago, so I'm touching on the points that will make you believe this. Genesis 46. Genesis 46, verse 1. And Israel, Jacob, took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, he said, here I am. And he said, I am the God, the God of your father. Fear not to go down into Egypt for I will make make there I will there make of you a great nation. I will go down with you into Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again, and Joseph shall put his hand upon your eyes. So look at the typology. They went in as 70 people. They came out as four million, roughly. We don't know the exact number. So think about it. During the tribulation, 
Jesus is going to save a third. There's only 7 million Jews in Jerusalem right now. Does anybody know that? There's probably 15 million Jews worldwide out of 8 billion people. Did you ever think about that? 8 billion people, there's only 15 million Jews, 7 million in Israel. So the numbers almost exactly match up with what's going on there. So if Jesus saves a third, listen, they, they go in a remnant, they'll come out a nation. When's that? At the end of the millennium, they will be hundreds of millions of Jews because people are going to live to be a thousand years old again, and they're going to repopulate the kingdom of God. So it all matches up. It's gold. So Joseph came from Rachel. He is Jesus. He's the one that's going to save him. Joseph hid himself from his brothers, but the second time he revealed himself. So he's going to come in and save them, and then he's going to save the remnant at the end when they look on him, and they will mourn after him like an only son. So the typology is there. The three matriarchs, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and there's so much more. Oh. All right, we'll keep moving. We'll keep moving. Oh, it's Genesis 46, 20. Look at Genesis 46, 26, and 27. It says, all the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, all the souls were three score and six. 66, there's the number of the books of the Bible. And then it said, when you added Joseph, his wife, and two sons, it equaled 70. So 70 people went into Egypt, 4 million came out. All glory to God. Here we go. And remember, Joseph had two dreams. He said, the 11 stars, the sun, moon, and stars, the 11 stars will bow down to me. That's a picture of Christ. So at the end, on the Revelation 12 sign, when he comes back at the Feast of Trumpets, they will bow down to Christ. So it, it's all there. There's so much to dig out of this. Now listen, the fourth barren woman was Hannah. She had Samson. Now think with me on this. Think with me on this. Samson killed people. Samson was the strong man. I got to turn to Isaiah 63. So look at Samson. His mother was barren. God opened her womb. Samson was a Nazarite. He took the Nazarite vow. Jesus was a Nazarite. So Sam, listen to this. Samson ruled Israel for 20 years. King David ruled for 40 years. Solomon ruled for 40 years. So think about that. Samson ruled 20 years, which means half of the tribulation. So in the second half, when Christ comes back, listen, you all know Christ is coming back early, right? He's coming back to reap the grapes and the sickle. You ever read where the, the bridle of the blood, or, or, well, the blood will be up to a bridle of a horse? Everybody thinks that's Armageddon. That's not Armageddon. Isaiah 63 is before Armageddon. So he comes back early. Samson is the type. Remember, Samson alone killed a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. We all know and love that story. He's the strong man. Also, remember, remember the dark sayings, the enigma? They're all found in Judges chapter 14. So that word is 17 times used. Samson used like 10 of them. 10 of them because Samson gave the riddles. So God gives the riddles. Samson's a type of Christ. Look at Isaiah 63. Who is this that comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? That this that is glorious in his apparel. He's glorious in his apparel. That's Jesus. Traveling in the greatness of his strength. Samson, traveling in the greatness of his strength. Samson, 
I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. That's in red. Why are you red in your apparel? Your garments like him that treads in the wine fat. Revelation 14, the grapes, the wine fat. I have trodden the wine press alone. Samson killed a thousand alone. I'm telling you, this matches up. And of the people, there was none with me, for I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation to me, and my fury, it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in my anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth." Praise God, I'm telling you, Samson is in the typology of the tribulation. So we're raptured with Isaac. The two nations enter in. Joseph shows up on the scene, saves a remnant from the seven-year famine, the seven-year tribulation. Samson shows up at the halfway point. And next is Hannah who had Samuel. Now, if this one doesn't convince you, nothing will. you got to stay with me on the Samuel. Here we go. And listen, I had a sister, Christina, I don't know if you're in here, but remember you were thinking about this and you didn't see it? I went back and looked at it and said, man, what is it? Maybe it isn't. It is. Wait, wait till you hear this one. All right, I got, I'm, I got missing sheets here. I got to come up with this. All right, that one's done. All right, first, first Samuel chapter eight. Let me get it. All right, everybody with me? Praise God, let's go. First Samuel, Samuel chapter eight, verse one. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second, Abiah. Okay, they were just crooked. The point of the story is they turned aside for filthy lucre, bribes, perverted judgment, the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you're old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to rule us like all other nations. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us, rule us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, see, they've been foul the whole time, false, harlot, adulterous, idolatrous, Wherewith they have not, they have, they have forsaken me and served other gods. So do, so do they also to you. Now therefore, hearken to their voice, however, yet protest solemnly to them and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Now listen, if you read this next section, it's God says, 15, and he will take a tenth of your seed. He will take a tenth from you. They're paying tithes to Saul. Saul is a type of Antichrist. Hear this. Samuel 
is a type of Moses and Elijah in the tribulation. What is a Mo Moses and Elijah going to do? They're going to warn the people, don't take a king over you. Don't take a king over you. Serve God. I'm telling you, this is what it means. So Moses was the ruler of Israel. He was a priest. He sacrificed to the Lord. He was a prophet. Moses was the prophet. He was really, some say, the greatest prophet besides Christ. Samuel was the first prophet ever of Israel. Samuel was the last judge, ruler of Israel, and Samuel also was a priest. The typology is there. He represents the greatest prophet, Elijah, and Moses. And listen, what do you think Moses and Elijah are going to say? What, what's their message? Don't worship the Antichrist. Do not worship him. Worship God. The kingdom of God is coming. It's perfect typology. This is all the barren women and the sons that they have all represent the typology of the tribulation. I'm telling you, God gave me all the middle ones. He gave me Isaac. He gave me the Shunammite. And he filled in the whole story the other night. I'm telling you, it's all there. Praise God. All right, this one. This one, I'm telling you, is pure and utter gold. I got to make sure I got these scriptures in here. Man, I feel like I'm missing a sheet of paper, which is impossible. I went over this a million times. I mean, where did I write that down? It's got to be in here. There it is. Okay, we got it. All right, now this one nobody knows about, really. So 2 Samuel, no, 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 1 Samuel 18. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 20, and I'm going to try to put this together. So we've got five barren women. we got Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Samson's mother, the wife of Manoah, so her name's not there. And then you got Hannah the mother of Samuel. The sixth one, the sixth one is Michal, David's wife, the daughter of Saul, who Saul is a type of Antichrist. So listen, God said to Samuel, I just read it, Samuel, don't be discouraged. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Jesus said, when one comes in his own name, him you will worship. So they want a king to rule over them. God gives them a king to rule over them. He is Satan and the Antichrist. Whether it's Judas or not coming back, we'll find out. I think it is. It's not even a point to argue about. It'll all happen. Okay, so McCall is the sixth barren woman. Why six? Why did God put her number six? Look at that, 666, the number of man. Ultimately, this represents Satan. So 1 Samuel 18.20, stay with me on this one. This one will bless you. 1 Samuel 18.20, it says, and Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David, and they told Saul, and this thing pleased him. So Michal loved David. That's where we start. Now go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. All right, now th this is a little bit of reading, so stay with me. We're Bible studying. Praise God. All glory to God. We love this word. 2 Samuel chapter 6, 6 through 23. And I just want to read it all so you get the whole gist of it. 2 Samuel 6, 6 through 23. And when they came to Nakan's threshing floor, and I, I don't know, pronounce the names perfectly, so I'm just going to roll through it. 
Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. So he reached out to grab the ark of God. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died. There he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Pereza, Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So basically saying, I don't want this ark. That guy got killed for just reaching out and touching it. So David's afraid. So David would not remove the ark of the Lord to him in the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. This is such a cool story. And it was told King David, saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertains to him because of the ark of God. So David went to go get it and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they had bore the ark of the Lord, had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen, and fatlings, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, who loved David, Oh, I lost my place. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Look at that. Remember, Esau despised his birthright. So look, I, there's probably typology in the story. I didn't even look for it, so I don't I don't know. There probably is. That's not my point with this. And they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings, peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering, Bur offering burned offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well as to the women and men, to everyone a cake of bread. This is a celebration. A cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. So all the people departed, one to his house. They all went home with dessert, food, wine, celebration. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is back in the city of David. Then David returned to bless his household, and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself to today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michal, it was before the Lord, which chose me before your father and before all the, his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. I will celebrate before the Lord. That's what that means. And I will yet be more vile than thus and will be base in my own sight and of the maidservants which you have spoken of. Of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore, Michal, look, get this, this is, 
This is 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 23. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. Why did God put that in there? There's a barren woman that stayed barren. She's the sixth barren woman representing, long story short, Satan. 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 Listen, Satan had children. Satan had children from Genesis 3. God said, I'll put enmity, enmity between you and the woman, her seed, and your seed. Satan's had children. Have you ever heard of the Nephilim, demons, half-breeds, all the fallen angels, the ones that also had relations with women? God's saying, in the tribulation, you will be like you are barren. You're the daughter of Saul, who's a type of Antichrist, right? Moses and Elijah are warning them, don't take Antichrist as your king. It's the same thing Samuel said. He gave the warning. And listen, God said, tell them what will happen to them. So I didn't read the rest of it, but 1 Samuel chapter 8, go back. They pay a tenth to Saul, a tenth to Saul, a tenth of their children to Saul. When Antichrist walks into the temple and declares himself God, you don't think he's going to collect a tenth? He's going to claim to be God, and he's going to make people tithe to him. The Jews will tithe to Antichrist. This is why I know the typology is right. Saul's a type of Antichrist. Samuel, it's perfect. This is why Hannah was barren. Praise God. I hope you got that. So McCall was the sixth one. She died barren. So at the end of the tribulation, this is what God says to Satan. It'll be just like you were barren. All this seed you had, they'll all be tossed in the lake of fire, just like you were barren. Praise God. Let's go. Oh, man, I, I love that one. That one actually made the most sense. Not the most, but big sense in there. All right, look at this. Look at this now. Psalm 41.9. You got you to gotta go to that. This is semi-familiar. People know about it. Some of you might not. All right. All the commentaries will tell you that this Psalm 41.9 is talking about Judas Iscariot, okay? And on the surface, it's correct. Especially, especially, keep this in mind, that Judas, I think, was the absolute seed of Satan. Jesus said, didn't I, didn't I choose you 12? Yet one of you is the devil. So in the Greek, they call that the definite article. He didn't say a devil, a demon. He said the devil. So Judas is the seed of Satan. And remember, when Judas betrayed him, Satan entered into Judas. So the father and the son were like one. So think about that. So all your commentaries will tell you Psalm 49.1 is Judas. I think it's actually talking about Satan. Look what it says. It says, yea, yea, my own, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Mine own familiar friend whom I trusted has lifted up his heel against me. So if Jesus chose Judas and he knew he was a devil, is he really going to call Judas my old familiar friend? You know, he walked with him for three and a half years. I think it's Satan. So back before Satan fell, think about it, he was probably the most glorious angel ever created. Listen, McCall loved David. That's why I read that. McCall loved David, and then at the end, she hated him in her heart. McCall is the type of Satan. He will be barren. 
He was an old familiar friend. He loved the Lord once. You know, Lucifer loved the Lord once. But when sin was found in him, he ultimately hated him in his heart. Anybody say amen if that makes sense. Praise God. That is the typology. This is the culmination of all the typology in the Bible. The barren women had to mean something, right? It had to mean something. It's not just random. God didn't make Samson's mother barren. There's no purpose for it. There's no purpose for Samson's mother to be barren. All right. So now we're to the Shunammite woman. And look it, I've already kind of tore this apart, right? Let me make sure I got it. She's the great woman. This is the end of the tribulation. This is the end. Oh, I got so much on this. I don't know if I want to do the long version. Praise God. Because then it dips into the other study. All right, listen to this. I, I said that God gave me that, that nugget. So my initial thought that started me on this was, why did Isaac's birth have to be an appointed time? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. He, they could have had Isaac at any time and started this flow. Any time they could have had Isaac. But no, God showed up and said, next year at the appointed time, in the time of life, you will have a son. Now listen, I'm almost convinced that the time of life, that September 11th day, could be, probably is the first day of creation or the sixth day of creation when he breathed life into Adam. It's got to be one of those two days. I don't think it's the Feast of Trumpets because I think that's when tribulation starts. It could be, but I think we go before that. Now get this. Get this. I'm going to I'm going to do this. I want you guys to get it. So, Isaac's birth was an appointed time. Not Esau and Jacob, not Joseph, not Samson, not Samuel. McCall was barren. She's the sixth, so she never had a child. The Shunammite woman was the appointed time. Why? Why the first and why the last? Because the rapture is an appointed time and the second coming is an appointed time. So, listen, Revelation 19. I gotta probably do this. Did anybody get that right there? I, I pray to God you got that. The second coming is an appointed time. The rapture is an appointed time. That's why only those two on the end, and that proves it, that the typology of these barren women is, is the rapture and through the tribulation. Listen, I gotta say this before I forget. In the millennium, the Bible says the knowledge of the Lord will flood the earth. We don't need typology in the millennium. Jesus is gonna be on earth. We're going to be here ruling and reigning in glorified bodies. We don't need any more typology. So this is the crux of it. This is the pinnacle of it. The barren women either mean nothing or they mean everything. Look at all the people that came from these barren women. God did not have to make them barren. He made them barren so we'd look at it. So we'd say, why are these women barren? The three matriarchs that are going to make a great nation? All of them, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, all barren. Oh, I forgot about that verse. Oh, where's that one? Oh, I threw it on the floor. Listen. All right, Genesis 49, 31. This will just bless you. So you had Leah and Rachel. We're Leah. We're Leah out of those two. Rachel was first. Jacob loved Rachel first. Remember, the first will be last, 
The last will be first. We are Leah in that story. So look what God put in here as a clue that the church is represented by Leah in the story. Genesis 49.31. Genesis 49.31, it says, There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. Leah was buried with Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Rebekah. Why? Why would God put that in there? Why would Leah's burial have to be mentioned in the Bible? Does anybody see that one? Praise God, I love that. All the, listen, all this typology. The Shunammite woman. Here's another one, the Shunammite. This, this was a semi-nugget. Lord just brought it to my mind. Thank you, Father. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through 37 is the story. Okay. The boy went out, my head, my head. Listen. And he said to his father, my head, my head. We know the Shunammite boy died at noon. Amos 8.10 says the sun's going to be darkened at noon. That, that could be the second coming. That is the second coming. I just said the appointed time for the Shunammite woman to show up is the second coming. That's why the noon is in there. That's why he died at noon. My head, my head. The word head is Rosh, Rosh Hashanah. The tribulation's going to start on the Feast of Trumpets. It's going to end on the Feast of Trumpets, the official ending of it. It's Rosh, Rosh, my head, my head. The Shunammite woman is the seventh. She's going to come back. That's why it's in there. Amos 8, 10, I'm going to darken the sky. Matthew 24, 30 says, I'm going to darken the sky and the sign of the Son of Man will be seen. He doesn't come at, the right, at that moment. We see the Revelation 12 sign. They will, not us. We're coming back. The whole world will be dark, but God's going to light up the sign of the revel. The sign of the Son of Man is going to be seen. He's going to darken it at noon. This is incredible. Look at the typology in here. That's not even what I wanted to show you. <laughs> Listen, the boy died and the father said, Wherefore will you go today? It's not a new moon nor Sabbath. The woman said, it'll be well. It'll be well. She said it three times. Remember the story? I hope you guys read the story by now. Shunammite woman, 2 Kings 4, 8 through 37. So they asked her. Even when Elisha saw her, he sent Gehazi and said, hey, go ask her. Is she good? Is her husband good? Is her child good? She said to Gehazi, it is well. She said to her husband, it is well. So she's saying it is well. Her only son just died. Now think about this. Think This one hit me. I'm telling you, one of our favorite verses. This Bible don't turn good. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. She said, it is well. It dawned on me, she had faith. She knew her son would be brought back to life by the man of God who's a type of Christ, Elisha. Does that not make sense? Oh, that, that was her reaction. Didn't say she cried or nothing until she got to the man of God. And then she grabbed hold of him and said, what have you done? You got to come back. I, as the Lord lives, I will not leave you. I'm telling you people, I have not exhausted any of this. None of it. There's more in here. 
But listen, I got I to gotta get to this. Lord, help me do it. Help me do it. Listen, the reason I'm hesitating is because this, this study goes on forever. It, it leads into something else, but it's amazing. So we know the book of Revelation, right? You know, the, the apocalypse, the apocalypse. It means the revealing of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. It's not just Jesus's revealing. The Shunammite woman is the end of the tribulation. It's the second coming. Amen to that. Inexhaustible. It's the second coming. It's also the revealing of the bride. The bride. It's the bride. The Jewish wedding. They go into the wedding chamber for seven days. They come out. He takes the veil off his bride and he says, here's my bride to the whole wedding party. And then they have a feast. That's what it is. That's why she's called the great woman. We're the pearl of great price. It all matches up. Israel, unfortunately, was the harlot. We're the great woman. Now look at this. Go to Revelation 19. Oh, I, listen, I'm telling you, this is a whole nother study, but I want you to see this, but I got to find the right sheet. Okay, there it is. Okay, there it is. Lord, help me to do it. Help me to do it, Father. Now, listen, you guys got to get this. It's amazing. So that all that typology, it's all there. Uh, do you really get that? It starts with the rapture, the appointed birth of Isaac. It ends with the appointed second coming of the Shunammite woman being revealed. It's not just Jesus. Of course, Jesus is going to be revealed. Oh, man, we, we, we might have to keep going all night. I got so much more on this. All right, look at this. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage feast, that shouldn't be marriage, that should be feast, For and I already studied this out, for the marriage feast of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. Verse 8, and to her, think about it, talking about the wife, 7 and 8, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he says to me, John talking, right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're not called to the supper. Does everybody understand that? We're the bride. We don't have to be called to our own wedding feast. So you got to remember that. He said to me, right, Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he says to me, these are the true sayings of God. Now, we already read verse 10 about the spirit of prophecy. I skipped over this on purpose. Watch this. And I fell at his feet to worship him. Why did John fall at his feet right there after John saw who? Who did John see? He saw the glorious bride. John saw the bride. He was so overwhelmed, he didn't know what to do. He worshiped the angel. Of course, the angel said, don't do it. Praise God. Now look at this. You, we can skip over that. Think, think about this. It, it can't do it justice. The English is no good here. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Clean and white? What were we, rolling around in the dirt up in heaven so we just got a, a wash and now we got clean clothes? It's not what it means. It's not what it means. Clean means pure, purified by fire. Get this, free from corrupt desire. Sin, listen, free from sin and guilt, blameless 
innocent, unstained with the guilt of anything. This is the definition. Unstained with the guilt of any anything. No corrupt desires. Purified by fire. This is the Greek word for clean. When we read that, we don't even think about it. <clears throat> Listen, honor. Verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to the Lord. Honor to Christ. That word honor means glory, glorious, magnificence. Now, we're clean and white. Look what white means. Look what white means. Listen, when we read that, all we think of is a white robe or something, a white garment. White, and look this up. Look it up. It's all there. White means shining, brilliant, clear, transparent, splendid, magnificent, gorgeous, radiant. This is why John fell down and he was overwhelmed. He was overwhelmed. He's looking at the bride coming out. The Shunammite woman, the great woman is being revealed to the world. Jesus is showing us off. This is what's happening. Jesus is showing off his bride, the hand-picked bride of the Father. I'm telling you, this is 100% true. Test it. Pray about it. Praise God. All glory to God. Now look at this. Other usages of the word clean. Revelation 21.18. Same word. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper and the city was pure gold. It's the word pure. Pure gold. Revelation 21.21. 21. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, pure as it were transparent glass. That's our word. That's the word for clean. Revelation 22, 1, and he showed me a pure river of water. People, we're, we're pure. We're going to be pure. It's unbelievable what we're going to be. All right, the word clean or the word white is Revelation twenty two sixteen. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David. I am the bright and morning star. That's the word for white, bright. He's bright. We're bright. We're both like transparent glass, brilliant, shining. Listen, the word means shining. That's what it means. John saw us on white horses, shining. This is going to be incredible. Listen, Matthew 24 doesn't say it. And, and this, you got to hear me. Listen, the post-tribber, he didn't put it in Matthew 24. And this is just my opinion. I think it weeds out the post-tribbers. It weeds them out. You know how Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And everybody went home. Jesus was never looking for a big crowd. He knew who was his. So if Matthew 24 would have had us coming back on the horses, then they couldn't say it's a post-trib rapture. So now they could read Revelation 19 like we did, but they don't do it for whatever reason. God bless them. But, but God turns out all the lights. You see the sign first, and then you see the brilliance of Jesus and us, his bride coming back to this earth, the great woman. Oh, praise God. The bright and morning star. Same word. All right. 
Now, before you thought the typology was over, isn't there one more barren woman in the Bible? Is there one more barren woman in the Bible? Let's see. Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, uh, the wife of Manoah, Hannah, McCall, who stayed barren. She's six. The Shunammite woman. There's the second coming. Is there another one? Elizabeth. Who did Elizabeth have? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Oh, Lord, you want me to go into the full study? This could be the full shot right now. Praise God. Listen to me, people. John the Baptist is number eight. Eight is the number of new beginnings. Most everybody knows that. It's the kingdom of God. That's the new beginning, the millennial kingdom. John the Baptist announced the kingdom the first time. John the Baptist will come back in an eternal body and he'll do it again. John the Baptist will announce the kingdom again. Do you get that? The barren women telling a story. It is incredible. Now think about this. John the Baptist baptized Jesus. What's he going to do this time? He's going to anoint him king. He's going to anoint him with oil as the king during the millennium who sits on the throne of David. It's perfect. It's perfect typology. And yet I believe John's really coming back to do that. Absolutely. He was the herald of the king. He will be the herald of the king again. Remember, Jesus said there's none born of a woman that was greater than John the Baptist. This is why. This is why. Because he got to announce the king twice. <laughs> and there's more to this too. If I keep going, uh, so we keep going? Oh, praise God. If we keep going, I got to figure this out. All right. Let, let's do this. Let's go to Genesis 17. Oh, anointing the king with oil, by the way. That's uh, Daniel 9.24. That's Daniel 9.24. So again, I, I told you in the video, there's scripture attached to all this. So now, now if we get there right now, your, your minds are just going to be blown. They should be. All right. Genesis 17. I'll try to do this kind of quick, I guess. Genesis 17, verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Isn't it funny that God changed the names of Abraham and Sarah right before the son of promise was born? If the son of promise is the rapture next month, what happens to us? God renames us. He renames us. This It's all in here. It's all in here. This, I'm telling you, this is nuts. So he said, don't call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be, shall her name be. <clears throat> and I will bless her and give you a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be the mother of all nations. So we, again, Virgo in the Revelation 12 sign is Sarah. It's not Mary. It's not, you know, Israel, so to speak. It's Sarah. Sarah means princess, by the way. Sarah means princess. She's the one with the crowns on her head. It's perfect. Okay. She shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Kings of people. Hold on to that. Listen, I looked up the word king. It means kings. It means royal. Okay. So let's go to first Peter two, nine. 
And that, look, this is a familiar scripture, so you'll know it, but I'll read it because it's gold. First Peter chapter two, verse nine. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praise of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now think white, think clean, think shining, think brilliant. That's what it means, marvelous light, okay? So we're royalty, we're kings. Um, Revelation, one of my new favorite verses, Revelation chapter one, verses five and six Please let this sink in. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. We're going to hold on to that for a second. And the prince of the kings of the earth, the prince of the kings of the earth, to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Verse 6 and has made us kings and priests to God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. People, we're going to be kings. This is what I'm telling you. Okay. Proverbs 25.2. And this is very familiar. I say it all the time, but you got to think. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Why is it the honor of kings? We're kings because we're rapture hunters. Do you get that? We're living in the lukewarm era when everybody else is indifferent, everybody else is a rapture denier, post-tribber, whatever. We are the ones searching it out. It's the honor of kings to search it out. So think about it. This is something God has hidden. God has hidden. Why does he call us kings? That's not an accident. You think the kings of Israel were searching out the mysteries of God? 90% of them was, was evil. You ever read the Old Testament? And so-and-so became king, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. So-and-so became king, he did evil. In the sight. It's not talking about them. It's talking about us. We are the kings that are searching out the mysteries. I just read you Revelation 1. He's going to be the prince of kings. God has made us kings. We're the searchers. We're the kings. So check this out. <laughs> so now we go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, right at the end of Paul's life. Right at the very end of Paul's life. 2 Timothy 4, 8, 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Hereafter, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. That's the day. And not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. We are going to get a crown of righteousness because kings wear crowns. Kings wear wear crowns. Now there's other crowns. I'm not saying other people up in heaven can't have crowns. It's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying the searchers, the enigma solvers, the guessers, the trackers of the secrets, just like the prophets of old, the prophets of old searched and craved for it like we search and crave for it. Listen, we're going to be rewarded. I'm telling you. Okay. Now, go back to Revelation chapter 3, okay? Verse 10, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, how many times have you read this to a post-tribber and it makes no difference to them? 
no difference. They'll explain it away. They'll ignore it. They will not, they'll say nothing about it. Who loves Revelation 3.10? We do. Pre-trib rapture watchers. So what did God say to us because we love this verse? The very next verse, verse 11. God said, Jesus said, words in red, behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast, which you have, that no man take your crown that no man take your crown. We have a crown coming. We're kings. Now get this. This was revelation to me. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. Revelation 17, 14. These shall make war with the lamb. So this is the war, Antichrist, in the thick of it. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Do you know what never dawned on me? We know Jesus' title is king of kings. He's the king of of us the kings. Does that make sense? I never thought of it that way. He's the king of kings. We always looked at it as, well, all the kings that ever was, he's the best one. That ain't what it means. He's the king of kings. I just read it in Revelation 1, 5, and 6. It said, he's the prince of kings of the earth. Amen. I'm telling you, I never thought of that before. Praise God. All glory to the Father. I'm telling you, this is amazing. Now get this. I think it's Galatians 3.28. Galatians 3.28. No, it ain't. Okay, it could be. Hold on. All right. For as many, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now get this, 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Listen to me. The last prayer that Jesus prayed publicly best prayer is John 17, before he went to the cross. And what did he say? Father, I pray that they will be one with us. You and them, I and you, them and me. It's John 17. It's all there. Read it. Listen, listen to me and tell me if this doesn't make sense. When I, when I say as a man, I'm the bride of Christ. I'm going to marry the Lord. You know, some people get a little squeamish, right? Well, I'm a man. I'm marrying Jesus. He's a man. You know what I mean? So look at, um, look at on the other end. You're a woman and you're told you're going to be a king. So instantly you would say, well, don't you mean queen? You know, I'm a woman. I'm a queen. Listen to me, you guys. We're not, we're, we're I don't even know how this works, but it says right there, we're neither male nor female. <clears throat> we're going to be the essence of God, the nature of God. Don't tweak out on me. Don't tweak out on me. I'm not saying we're going to be a God and go off and run our own world. That's not what I'm saying. This was my second revelation. I'm telling you, do you know how it says Jesus is the only begotten? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John, it's only in the gospel of John when it says it about Jesus. John said it five times in the gospel of John. John 1.14 one eighteen, John three sixteen, John three eighteen, John first John four nine. 
Jesus is the only begotten. We are not queens. Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. Now hear me. This was my revelation that blew my mind. And there's a million scriptures to back it up. We've been saying these scriptures, but we don't know what it means. Okay? He's the only begotten of the Father. So what I want you to picture is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're in eternity past. They're working this all out. I don't know how long, all of it. We know in eternity past, they figured this out. Listen to me. We're going to be added to that. We're going to be added to the Trinity in nature, in essence. I knew this would tweak some of you. I'm telling you, listen to me. This is unbelievable. And I don't know if you're saying repent to me or somebody else. So I'm not keeping up with the conversation. Jesus is, listen, Jesus is the only begotten, but the Bible says he's the first begotten of many brethren. 1 John 3, 2 says, when we see him, we will be like him. And listen, all the people in here mocking, you got one chance to be part of this. And if you blow it, you'll, you'll be lake of fire or you will be out. I am telling you. Listen to me. We say things like this. I've said things like this just so you know I'm guilty of it. We say, oh, I wonder what job I'll have in heaven. Uh, you know, I just want to get in. I'll clean the toilets. I'll sweep the streets. You know, um, I think Jesus will teach us forever, all eternity, and that'll be great. You know, we'll sit under his teaching. We say all these things. Forget all that. God said, let us make man in our image. We tried to explain that many, many ways. Oh, that, you know, we're body, we're soul, we're spirit. There's our trinity. He's a trinity. There's our trinity. It's not what it means. Remember I said in my video, take everything literally. People, we're going to be the nature and the essence of God. Why? Look at it from God's view. Look at it from God's view. He wanted children just like himself. So, We'll have bodies. Listen, Jesus gave it up. He gave it up to be confined to a glorified body for all eternity. He did it for us. It is unbelievable. You don't believe me? Let me read you some scriptures. Let me read you some scriptures. Where are they? I'll find them. Here we go. All right, man, it, it, they're all over the place, by the way. They're all over the place. It's all over the Bible. And what I'm telling you, what I'm telling you is God wanted you guys to know this. I believe that in my heart. He wanted you to know that we're not going up there and working a job. We're not going up there and sweeping the floors. We're going to be like him. Listen, have you ever said this? How we how how are we all going we got hundreds of millions up there. Are we all going to stand in line and wait to see Jesus? Are we all going to stand in line and wait to see the Father? We're going to be connected to him. John 17, we're going to be one with him. We're going to always be with him. Listen to me. Psalm 1611 says, in his presence is fullness of joy. When we get glorified, we'll always be in his presence. We'll always be connected to him. We'll be connected to each other. Think Family, think family. God, listen, when I was scratching, remember I told you I was scratching, scratching, scratching? I'm scratching all this down. And what I ultimately came up with is, 
God has the love and the power to actually make us like himself. Like himself. So when you read the verses of like Hebrews 1.3 that says Jesus was the express image of God, we will be the express image of God. We will be that. I'm telling you this is truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now think about that. The deep things of God? Now we're talking deep. Listen, we can't even fathom God but what we know out of his word. So when you go into the depths of God, think about what that's talking about. So what that verse means is the Holy Spirit let us know, but we don't know. We know we're going to be like him, but we don't know what that's going to be like until we get there. That's what it means. Eye is not seen. Ear is not heard. Mind is not conceived, you know, perceive this. But I'm telling you, in a month from now, praise God, all glory to God, we're going to have this. Jesus is the only begotten, and then he becomes the first begotten of many brethren. When we see him, we will be like him. I mean, this is unbelievable. And listen, get this. When you match these words up with the Old Testament, the, the first begotten, the first begotten matches up with Genesis 22, 2, talking about Isaac. God said, take your only begotten son and sacrifice him to me. Remember when God challenged Abraham to sacrifice the son of promise? It's the same word only begotten. So it even ties into Isaac. Okay, I got to read some of these. I mean, it's just incredible. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. I might even back it up to 14. Look at this. Ephesians 3, 14. Paul, for this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. And remember, we're the bride, we're shining. We got this body, we're the essence of God that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend, may be able to, you might not be able to, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passes all knowledge. We, we can't even get the knowledge of the love of Christ that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Tell me what that means. Tell me what the fullness of God means that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. 
We can't even ask for it. We're asking for jobs in heaven. We're asking to get in the door and clean toilets. We can't even ask it or think it, what he has for us. Now to him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, get this, throughout all ages, throughout all ages, that means throughout all eternity, world without end, amen. Listen, we've read this. We've read these scriptures. We just don't pertain it to the reality. We try to apply it down here. Oh, Jesus will get me that job. He'll get me that promotion. He'll, he'll make this thing happen. It's not what it's talking about. It's talking about being one with God. God is so loving and so powerful that he's literally going to make us like himself. If you can even believe it, he's going to make us like himself. And listen, I can prove it with a different line. Let me find it. Luke, Luke 7, 28. Check this out. And this, look at this stuck in my head forever. And I never really knew what it meant. So I'm like, man, that, you know, one of those things, like, I don't know what that means. I hope this is it. Here we go. Luke 7, 28. Look at this. Jesus talking. For I say to you, among those that are born of a woman, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Listen to me. John said he's a friend of the bridegroom. Now, this is my theory. God said to Abraham, your seed cannot be numbered. My theory is through all eternity, there will be people like Adam and Eve. They will repopulate eternity forever. So God will have that group of people. Then he'll have John the Baptist, who said he's friend of the bridegroom. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Job said, I will stand on the earth and I will see my Redeemer. Job said that. So I think, the, listen to me, the Old Testament saints are going to have an eternal body. But we're the only ones that are going to be one with the Father and the Son. He'll have three groups of people through all eternity. And we'll all be one family even with the elect angels, which there's probably billions of them. Is everybody with me on this? We're the special group, I'm telling you. Not that we're above anybody. It's not like that. God wants a family, and he wants a certain group to be like him. We're not going to be like ourselves now. Remember what white means? Brilliant, free from guilt, free from sin, free from evil desire. We're shining. We're glorious. We're bright. People, I scratched on the pad the typology of the barren women. God filled in the middle for me, and then it kept going. I told you in the video, I was spooked. I looked over my shoulder like, What's going on here? Am I, is something happening to me? And, and I was coherent, all of it, didn't hear anything. My, my hand is going like this. And, and what it was saying is God wants us to be like him. He wants us to be like him. Think about it. He doesn't want to be a all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God to people, just people, just people, right? He wants to commune on that level. So listen, Jesus said, the Father is spirit, right? The Father is spirit. So the Father is going to be inside of all of us. So we'll be in constant 
communion with the Father and each other. I'm telling you, that's the way it's going to be. Listen, our judgment day before Christ, our judgment day before Christ, I think it's going to all happen at once. I picture us being in a line, waiting for judgment, waiting for judgment, waiting for judgment. It's all going to happen at once. I'm telling you, because of the power of the Lord. I got to find one of these verses in here. Hold on. There's a good verse, and I, I, I want to find it. Uh, oh, by the way, Hebrews eleven seventeen says only begotten of Isaac again. So there's the tie into Isaac. All right, let me. I, I don't know which one it is, but Colossians one. Let me do Colossians one. Father, I praise you. Listen, you guys, I stressed out over this. You guys don't fully know me. Some of you do. I stress because I want it to be right. I had 40 pages. I begged God. I know you guys were praying for me. I, I was not embarrassed to ask you to pray for me. But I struggle, and I, I just wanted to come out right. And here I basically got everything I wanted to say out. God is so good. He is amazing. Luke, read, read Luke 1. That'll tell you who Luke was. Luke said in Luke 1, I have a perfect understanding of everything. Three groups of people. And listen, that that could it could be more. I'm not dogmatic on that. But I know John the Baptist is the greatest born of a woman, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Why would Jesus say that? That was a clue. That's not just, and listen, Jesus hadn't even been to the cross yet. So he didn't lead Abraham's bosom up yet. So nobody's even up in heaven to compare that to. Do you see what I'm saying? That's the clue. All right, Colossians chapter one, verse 15 through 18. Okay, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God. Listen to this, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. That's first place. That means he's the first one. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. It's the same for us. It pleased God. It pleased God to make us like that. We'll be like that. I'm telling you, we will. Um, let me... Man, I'm looking for the one verse. I don't know where it is. It's got power in it. There it is. Ephesians 1. Thank you, Lord. All right, Ephesians 1. Listen, this matched up with the revelation I got from God when I was scratching on the gates. First to enter through the gates. Well, not really, because to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. Maybe the gates of the new Jerusalem, if that's what you're talking about, brother. All right, Ephesians 1, 19. Ephesians 1, 19. And I always got to back it up because that's what we do. Okay, Paul said, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's what we're getting right now. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, 
his calling. You know, people take that as, oh, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that. No, it's eternal. And what the riches, this proves it, and what the riches of the glory of of his inheritance in the saints. Let me reread that. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints, our inheritance, our glory. <laughs> Verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us? his exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, the world to come, eternity, and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So when I was scratching this down, the two words that kept coming was, it, it was weird. I got a weird feeling like, Lord, you're really going to make us like yourself? Like, it, it just, it sounded just, I don't know, like the fullness was hitting me. And the two words I kept coming up with is that he loved us so much and he had the power to do it. That's what I wrote down on my scratching. He loved us so much and he had the power to do it. So not only did he knit us together in his on our mother's womb and let us have life, and we live real life down here, make real decisions. We're sad, we're happy, we go through all of it. He helps us, we get jobs, he takes care of us. The whole thing, that's not the goal. The goal was that, he, that we would literally, now, literally be of his essence. Revelation 19, we're shining, we're brilliant, we're glorious, we're free from all sin and the guilt of sin. How many of us have guilt of sin? Pretty much all of us. We're co-heirs, we have an inheritance. I'm telling you, here's the thing. We've read all that, we know all that, but it hit me in reality. So if all this is happening next month, our minds are going to be blown off. We're not going to be the same. We're going to be pure children of God. We're going to be just like him. So I go all the way back to Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image. In our image. Not like our image in our image. Let us make man. Ultimately, that's exactly what they did. It's exactly what they did. And Christ Jesus, our Lord, the eternal son of God, he did it. He did it. He said, Father, this whole mission, this council, Isaiah 46 says, it pleased God to do his whole council. The son said, I'll do it. I'll do the mission. Now get this. This is a nugget that popped in my head. Somebody just made me think of it. Christ had to become one of us so we could become one of them. So we could become like the Trinity. Christ had to become one of us so we could become one of them. We know that God is one in three persons. Does that make sense? Praise God, let's go. And Sister Jen, I saw what you said, in a moment we'll be changed. I was thinking about that too. Listen to this. It says in a moment we all shall be changed, 
But 1 John 3, 2 says when we see him, we'll be like him. So either that's going to be the quickest of moments and we're in his presence and we see him, or I was thinking about this. <laughs> we're changed, but then when we see him in the air, then we just go boom. Listen, my family in here, praise God, God bless them. They are awesome. The ones I've been studying with for a year and a half. I had one rapture dream. It was right before God, oh, God got me on social media. It was a quick rapture dream. I'm going to tell it right now. I I have a reoccurring dream my whole life, like we all do, right? We're, you know, fluffy dream, whatever. So I have flying dreams sometimes, right? I fly in the dreams. I, I, mean, I even, haven't even had one in forever. Maybe, the, maybe that rapture dream was the last one, honestly. So sometimes I fly great. Sometimes I have no power to fly. I'll fall down. I'll hit the ground. It'll be weird. I'll wake up. I don't really get hurt. But it's a reoccurring dream. So when I'm in the dream, I fully know what's going on. I know I'm dreaming and this and this and that. So this dream, right before I started on TikTok, I'm telling you, you know I'm not a dream vision word of the Lord person. I tell you almost every time. So this dream was to me personally. That's what dreams are for. God speaks to the person, not to make a TikTok every five minutes that you had a word from the Lord. Okay, let it go. I'm, that's not what we're talking about. I had the dream. I'm flying like normal. And in, in my reoccurring dream, I always usually get too high and then I get scared. So I get too high and, you know, I start looking down and that's when the dream could go haywire. Well, this dream, I shoot up into space. So I'm up into space, stars, this and that, and I'm way high and it's just, you know, I know it's different now. I still know I'm in a dream. I'm up like this. This is what I'm in. This is my position arms out like Jesus on a cross type thing. So I'm up there and I see this sparkly swoosh. That's the uh, only thing I can describe it. It's swooshing through the air like wind and it's all sparkly and it hits me in the mouth. My mouth is open. I went and it's going like, put it this way. It's reverse of the fire of Godzilla. So Godzilla shoots the fire out. This was shooting in my mouth. And all, and I, listen, I wasn't even happy. I was just like, I was spooked a little bit. So it went into my mouth, through my mouth, and all I said was, Lord, and I just yelled, Lord, and I woke up. I didn't even know it was a rapture dream till I got up the next morning and told it to my wife. And then as I'm telling her the dream, because it was powerful, I'm like, man, was that a rapture dream? And that's that's the dream that I had. So We'll find out if it's a rapture dream or not when we get up there. But I think it was, we're going to be like God. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is alive and powerful. It's a discerner of the thoughts. I think the Bible, the word of God that's alive is going to turn us into the essence of God. And this is why it says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was was God. So Jesus, we know, is the living word. I'm telling you, I think it's the word of God that's going to do all of this, and we will be in that, like the essence of God. Listen, doesn't it make sense? We got all the scripture proof. I mean, 1 John 3, 2, let's read that. What do you, if you, if you were somebody who didn't believe what I'm saying right now, what would you say about this? 1 John 3, Verse one, behold, behold, what manner of love, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Do you see? Love, power, love, power. This is what I was scratching down. I didn't even realize this. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that 
when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Do you know what runs through my mind right there? In the Old Testament, you couldn't see God or you would die. You can't look at the glory of God or you're dead. He said to Moses, you can't see me and live. I'll sneak by you and show you my backside. And Moses came down from the mountain with a major sunburn. His face was gloriously shining. Moses got a little taste. Oh, praise God, my back's killing me. Oh. So anyway, when we see him, we will be like him. We can look in the face of the Lord and, and that will change us fully into the essence of God. He's the only begotten. We're not the Trinity, but we're going to be, he's the first begotten of many brethren. I'm telling you, we're going to be the essence of God. We're not just going to be normal people that'll live forever. It's not going to be like that. We're going to be like him and we're going to have perfect communion with him. It, we don't even know but it's gonna be amazing. Now look at this, Revelation 21, 24. I forgot about this one. The, listen, did, did you guys get that? I don't even know if I finished the thought. So because we're the essence of God, we're neither male nor female. So we can be the bride of Christ and a king. Do you get that? So women say, oh, I want to be a queen, not a king, just saying. And we say, oh, we got to marry the Lord. You know, I'm a man. I think that's what it means. We're going to be the bride. We're going to be the wife and we're going to be king. So we're not male or female anymore. We're one with the father and the son. We're of their essence. Oh, praise God. And then I'm going to read this verse. I got to get the dogs. Hold on one second. Dear God. God, the hip is sore. And look, we say stuff like that. I can't wait to get a new body. That's not even, we're, we're going to be so beyond a new body. It's going to be nuts. Let's go, Rovers. Staying out rude. You coming? Come on. And this may unfortunately mean that animals don't make it. I'm just kidding. I say that to rile people up. <laughs> All right. Revelation. Now, I never knew what this meant. I never knew when I read Revelation. Revelation 21, 24. But I'll back it up because that's what we do when we got double glasses on. And I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Verse 24, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. They walk in the light of it. See, it's shining. They walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth, that's us. I didn't know this. I never figured this out. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And remember, honor is shining, glory, glorified. So we're the kings, we bring our glory into the new Jerusalem, into the city. We will be, we will be the tight family of God of the same essence of the Father and the Son. Praise ye the Lord. Listen, everybody, this will, as we get closer to this rapture day, I'm going to try to do as many lives as I can just to stay on, stay encouraged, 
you know, do the whole thing. Just fellowship together. If the Lord gives us something new, obviously we share it, we do it, and we can uh, have good hangout sessions. I do lives where we just hang out, answer questions, all of it. I don't think it's Sukkot. I don't think it's Sukkot. I think that I think the tribulation has to start on the Feast of Trumpets. I really do. Because of Hosea 5, 7. When you see that word month in Hosea 5, 7, it means new moon. It, God says, I will destroy you on the new moon. And, and listen, it, it really could be September 11th, which is the 25th of Elul on God's calendar. So, and listen, we could be a day or two off. We, we could be a month off. I'm telling you, I think it's coming. And as we get closer to this day, I, I think the world's got to heat up. It's got to heat up a little bit. You know, the earthquake stuff going on, the evil, they, they got to do something. So I think God will make it known to his children that it's coming. So when it heats up, we'll know. Uh, where's my main sheet there? Uh, I lost all my papers, praise God. I think we go before Feast of Trumpets, I really do. So remember, remember, God said, I declare the end from the beginning. What beginning? What beginning? Abraham, Sarah, Isaac. That is the beginning of redemption. The beginning of redemption. So the beginning will be the rapture. Isaac, Genesis 18, 14. At the appointed time in the time of life. So I told you, before I pushed the button, God gave me the answer to why Isaac had to be born in an appointed time. Other than that, it doesn't make sense. They had 25 years to let Sarah be pregnant. It's an appointed time because it's rapture typology. It had to be appointed because the rapture's appointed. The Shunammite woman, the seventh, had to be appointed, the baby, the son, because the second coming is an appointed time. Man, does that make perfect sense? So this is the culmination of typology. I believe it. The barren women. The beginning with Sarah and Isaac. Rebecca sends two nations into the tribulation. The one who sold his birthright and the one that will be saved by Joseph who saved him from a seven-year famine. Samson is the strong man. Think about Samson. He would have no other purpose. How would you fit Samson into the story? Unless you read Isaiah 63 and Jesus says, I slaughtered him alone. I slaughtered him alone. He's the strong man. Christ is coming back. He's judging this earth. People don't realize, oh, God's just loving. He'll forgive anything you do, anything you say. He's coming back with a vengeance. So Samson is perfect. Samuel pleaded with the people, you don't want a king. You want God to rule over you. They said, no, no, no. Give us a king. Okay, here's Saul, type of antichrist. Samuel was the first prophet. He was a priest and he was the last judge. Moses was all three. Elijah was the greatest prophet of Israel, so it's a perfect typology. And that's going to be the message of Moses and Elijah, warning the people not to do it, just like Samuel warned the people. That's an exact typology. And then McCall, who represents Satan, mine own familiar friend, Psalm 49.1, you know, I used to trust you, but you lifted up your heel against me. Oh, and I forgot this. It, in Psalm 41, 9, it said, you ate of my bread. Did you ever read in the Bible where it says, 
There's angel food. The manna from heaven was angel's food. So that's the reference to Lucifer. So he had to be talking about Satan. You were mine own familiar friend, and then you turned against me. So what's the typology? McCall loved David, and at the end, she hated him in her heart. That's perfect. And it's the sixth barren woman who stays barren. Satan's seed is wiped out. And then, of course, the seventh is the great woman to be revealed, shining like the sun. We're the exact same image of Jesus Christ. He is the first begotten of many brethren. That's us. I'm telling you, that's what's going on. The Shunammite. And then John the Baptist kicks off the new age, the millennial kingdom. He announced the first kingdom. They rejected it. He will announce the second kingdom and he will anoint the Lord with oil. Daniel 9, 24. He baptized them the first time. This time he anoints them. This is God's storybook. This is God's storybook, and we're on the verge of it. The Lord wanted us to know. Praise God, he wanted us to know. Roo, Roo, what are you doing? You guys got to say hi to Roo. This is the noisy one. This is the sister. That's the big lug nut, the brother. What is it? What is it? You're going to be raptured, or you're going to eat people in the tribulation? Revelation 6, 8, the beast of the earth. What do you want to be, raptured or tribulation? She can't make up her mind. <laughs> Listen, peeps, it makes so much sense. John the Baptist kicks it off. I mean, isn't that awesome? Anyway, I, I saw you in here, brother Repo Man. God bless you. God bless you. You're the one that answered my, my first video I put on YouTube. You took the time to answer me. Praise God. God bless you. I do appreciate that, and I didn't forget it. Oh, look at this. I even wrote this down. I'm not even positive on this. Chew, chew on this, guys, with me a little bit. So I got Christ. Look at Christ is Isaac's a type of Christ. Joseph's a type of Christ, Samson's a type of Christ, Samuel's a type of Christ, Esau and Jacob are a type of the Jews, so there's one for the Jews, we're the Shunammite woman and Isaac, so we're two, McCall, excuse me, is a type of Satan, and then John the Baptist just kind of speaks for himself, new beginning, the eighth one. So even that kind of made sense, right? And what did Jesus say? I'm the first and the last. I'm the first and the last. We're going to be one with him. So we're the first and the last. We get raptured and we're the second coming, coming back with the Lord. Don't this all make sense? Praise God, sister. Amen. Listen, this is all glory to God. I kid you not. I sweated this out big time. I I'm telling you, I got 40 sheets of paper. It was like all these studies in one. I didn't even know what I was going to do. So God made this come out. Thank you, Lord. My phone's dying, so we're, we're probably going to have to shut this down, peeps. But listen, I will do bunches of lives. I, I don't have a schedule because I'm sloppy. But I will let you know, we'll do lives, we'll worship together right to the end. That's what I'm saying. We'll worship together right to the end. Well, I got a short cord, so I'd have to hold it in my hand. But <laughs> she says, plug it in. Uh, amen, you guys. Look at you guys showed up. You prayed for me. I know you did. I felt it, even though I was still scrambled. So I, God bless you. I appreciate you guys. <laughs> We're going to be in eternity. I'm telling you. We're going to be in eternity. Sister, somebody said this is automatically going to post to my channel. So I hope it does. So Somebody said it will be automatic. The, uh, the Right there. Five finger. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. You did tell us you'd be here. Praise God. This, this was a glorious night. So this was awesome. This was awesome. Some of you got a little bit different names from the regular group, I think. 
Praise God, praise God. Look, I, I'm listen, my true heartfelt prayer was that I could get it to you so it would bless your heart, your soul, what we have coming. Listen, listen to this. Once we're there, okay, now we know it, we're living it. I really believe God wanted us to know this before it happened. That's the joy of it. That's the mystery of figuring out an enigma. I mean, oh, it's, it's so good. It's so good. This story, when people miss this story and have to go to hell forever, what a shame. What a shame. I mean, I guess there were some mockers in here. I, I didn't really pay attention, but unbelievable. They're going to miss us. They're living in the same time we're living. And they, you know, they laugh at it. They mock it. It's horrible. Horrible. And I, I, I ain't mad at them. I, I feel bad for them. Amen, brother. Praise God. Praise God. All right. Listen, I love y'all. I'm going to, I really am almost dead on the phone. So let's just pray it out. Heavenly Father, Lord, I don't even have any words. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We love you with our whole heart, our soul, our minds, our spirit, our strength, everything. Lord, you made this happen. I'm so thankful. I feel so good inside, so lifted up. It was amazing. Father, thank you. We pray for our lost loved ones, our family, our children, our parents, everybody. We always lift them up. Lord, if they don't make the rapture, please save them in the tribulation. Revelation 319, Lord, you said you love them, so you're rebuking them. So let the lukewarm church that goes into the tribulation all be saved. We lift them up. We thank you for all the blessings. We thank you for the eternal joy that awaits us shortly. If there's anything else we need to know, Lord, I will have my face in the book. Please reveal it. I'll be looking and searching. Father, we love you and thank you. Jesus, we love you and thank you for making this all possible. Holy Spirit, we love you and thank you. We give you all the glory, all the praise. We will worship you forever, Lord. You've done it all. This is the greatest story ever told. What a story, Lord. Thank you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Praise Almighty God. He loves us so much and he has so much power that he can even make us like himself. In our finite brains, we don't understand it, but it's all written down in the word. Let us make man in our image. We will be in the exact carbon copy image of the only begotten who became the first begotten. I'm telling you that's true. So praise God, all glory to God. I don't even know what button I gotta hit to shut this down. I'm so afraid this won't post. We'll have to see. All right, listen, I'll see you soon. I'll see you on the next one. You guys, thanks for showing up. Praise God, I love each and every one of you. Uh, it was a wonderful night of Bible study and lifting up the name of God and his word. So we got it done. Thank you. Awesome. Praise God. Here we go. There's an X up here in the corner. Let's see. <laughs> Are you sure you want to stop streaming? I guess.